If you are starting a vertical farm and don't know where to begin or which technology would suit your needs, then reach out to the experts at Cultivated. As indoor farm brokers, they help connect you to the right technology and ensure your project is successful. Best of all, their service is Welcome free to the Vertical because they Farming work on behalf Podcast. Of their partners. Weekly conversations with fascinating CEOs, more, founders, and, spelled and ad tech visionaries. Join us every week as we dive deep into the world the of vertical farming notes. with Our your host, ideology Harry Duran. That ag needs to be disrupted in this massive way and that no one knows what they're doing and the future is in technology that disconnects animals from the program and that disconnects the consumer from a knowledge of where their products come from. We don't think that's where the future is really strong. Where we think the future is really strong is looking backwards to these animal husbandry practices that are well-worn, well-established, and leveraging technology to assist in those well-understood, well-established programs. This episode is brought to you by Indoor AgCon 2023. I'm so happy to have been working with the team last year. Indoor AgCon 2022 was my very first indoor farming conference. So it was really eye-opening for me. So I'll always be grateful to the team there for rolling out the carpet for me. <laughs> and I uh, really had a good time meeting a lot of past guests and excited to join them again this year. Entering its 10th year in a row, it's the largest trade show and conference for vertical farming and CEA, and it's returning to Caesars Forum Conference Center in Las Vegas on February 27th and 28th of 2023. Once again, they'll be co-located with the National Growers Association show as well, which is a really good fit for them. The conference keeps growing, and this year it's doubled in size. The expo floor now has more than 170 booths filled with new product resources and solutions to explore. You'll hear from experts, including CEOs, growers, investors, and others in the field during this full-scale educational conference. As always, you'll be able to connect with peers, grocers, and other potential new business partners at their great networking events. I haven't even gotten to the best part. The team at Indoor AgCon has given listeners of this show 20% off their full access conference pass. All you have to do is use promo code VFP, as in Vertical Farming Podcast, and sign up at indoor.ag. See you there. Vertical Farming Podcast, Season 7. Regular listeners, welcome back. So happy to have you back each and every week to listen to the show. I truly appreciate the folks that have been there from the beginning, the folks that just discovered it one or two seasons in, or folks that have recently discovered it, and this is maybe your second or third or fifth episode. If you are new, if this is the first time in this episode got into your hands and into your earbuds, then I'm so happy that you're here and I hope you'll keep coming back as we share some of the most fascinating interviews from CEOs and founders of the leading vertical farming companies from around the world. I'm your host, Harry Duran. In case you missed last week's episode, we had a great round two visit from Tobias Peggs, who is the CEO and co-founder of Square Roots. If you're not familiar with them, they're taking an innovative approach to creating not only a sustainable, but a resilient business and something that Tobias talked about was the company's focus on reducing carbon emissions and environmentally friendly packaging, which is something that doesn't get discussed a lot. And I'm seeing more and more folks talking about it now. We also talked about the importance of staying strong and focused on delivering products that customers actually want. So I really love the fact that Tobias came back and we had a, a brief meetup in person at AgTech NYC last year. And it was nice to see his face again. And hopefully I'll see him at a future conference as well. This week, speaking of conferences, I was at AgriMe conference in Dubai in October of 2022, and courtesy of the Cultivated team, I met up with Caleb Wilkins, who is the co-founder of Renaissance Ag. In this conversation, we discussed their revolutionary approach to creating safe and sustainable livestock feed, which is a first for this show. Caleb talks about their commitment to creating a consistent, reliable, and on-farm premium feed for livestock producers, as well as tackling the challenges of food independence and security, which, as you might hear in these conversations, is a common theme. It was great because we had a brief chat and a brief connection in Dubai, and I knew I wanted to have him on the show, so I'm glad we were able to make the timing work. I say it all the time. If you're loving the show, leave us a rating and a review. And I'm grateful to Marcos Enriquez from Spain who left us a five-star review. He says, I highly recommend this podcast. Living in a country where vertical farming is still in its infancy, I have to say that I've been motivated and inspired by most of the interviews I hear week after week. One thing that clearly stands out is Harry's ability to bring together experts and leaders from different parts of the world, but all with a passion for vertical farming. Muchísimas gracias, Marcos, for that review. And again, if you want to have yours read out, by all means, leave us a rating and a review at ratethispodcast.com forward slash VFP. Nothing brings a smile to my face like reading those out on the air. Excited for 
several conferences on the docket this year, so I'll be excited to connect with you, my fellow listeners, or past guests at Indoor AgCon, Indoor Ag Tech NYC. I'll be at the Vertifarm Conference in Dortmund, and whatever else might come up this year, we'll see what happens. But hopefully, if we do get an opportunity to meet in person, please, by all means, come up and say hi. Okay, before we get into this uninterrupted conversation with Caleb, here's a few words from the amazing folks that support this show. This year, Vertifarm takes place from September 26th through September 28th at the Exhibition Center in Dortmund, Germany. For those new to Vertifarm, it's the most significant trade fair for next-level farming and new food systems. Their international platform is set to showcase the latest developments in innovative controlled production systems for vegetables, salad crops, herbs, and microgreens, as well as sustainable fish, insect breeding, fruit cultivation, and medicinal plants. Vertifarm is shaping the future of vertical farming and new food systems. Reserve your ticket and learn more at vertifarm.de. That's V-E-R-T-I-F-A-R-M dot D-E. All right, Caleb Wilkins, CEO of Renaissance Ag. Thank you so much for joining me on the Vertical Farming Podcast. Yeah, pleasure to be here, Harry. So we're getting really in the weeds with our pre-interview chat. <laughs> And I realized we weren't recording, so I wanted to make sure we got some of the good stuff on. So you have a co-founder as well. You want to talk a little bit about that relationship as well? Yeah, happy to talk about that relationship. We've known each other for about 12 years. We grew up professionally together, so to speak, in the software space. We both entered software knowing nothing about software, and we left knowing nothing about software. That's the joke because I can't write any code. I mean, a little bit a very small amount of C++ and HTML, but it usually requires a lot of Google searching and using some of the online resources to copy and paste. So I wouldn't call it any coding. But through that interaction in that early stage software company, we learned that we both have like a, a similar approach to why we do things and what we care about. And eventually, you know, we got far enough along in our career that we decided, why don't we try to do some of the things that we care about? And from our perspective, you know, we thought it'd be really interesting if we spent our time working on people's access to food, water, and electricity. So we started a little holding company, and then we spent, you know, nights and weekends working on, mostly nights, working on our different concepts and our different ideas. And we ended up with food first. And initially we thought, let's tackle or try to tackle, you know, not to be who can tackle anything, but we want to try to tackle the last mile, you know, from the grocery store to the table, not to like your pantry or to your fridge, but all the way through to consumption. And there's a lot that goes on there. And there's a lot of, there's a tremendous amount of waste that happens. Like I always say about my fridge, food goes to die in my refrigerator. It doesn't be eaten. It goes to die. And then I throw it away and I buy more food and put it in there and let that die. And it turns out that's pretty common. And so, you know, we, we were focusing on that. And then we, as we got deeper and deeper into things, we realized that it would be probably more meaningful for us to really focus on the beginning of the food supply chain, on livestock producers, and assisting livestock producers from a foundational production perspective. But no real, you know, what the world would call expertise in this area. You know, our degrees are not in agriculture, our degrees are not in animal science or plant biology or horticulture or anything like that. I think I have a degree in psychology. I'm not exactly sure. I never got my diploma. I did walk. I'm not sure if I got my diploma, so I don't know. But my business partner, I don't know if he even got a grade for ninth grade. Maybe he got a grade for 10th grade. I don't know. Something like that. So, you know, we don't leverage our own backgrounds in agriculture to be interested in agriculture. What we leverage is our interest in freedom and our interest in domestic food production to drive our efforts in this space. And that's, you know, as I mentioned, access to food, water, and electricity, we think are incredibly important for everyone, anywhere they're at. And so we wanted to focus on trying to make an impact there. And, you know, if we do, awesome. And if we don't, you know, we die trying, I guess, Harry. Yeah, we'll get in, probably dig into a couple of aspects of what you shared there. So where's home for you? now right now home is vineyard utah have you been to utah i have in a previous job experience i've been to provo i think it's provo i'm trying to remember where i went yeah provo is right next door so there's provo and it goes up against the foothills and the benches of the wasatch mountain range 
And then if you go west from Provo, and I'm not talking very far west, I'm like throw a baseball west from Provo, there's Vineyard and then there's Utah Lake. So Utah Lake kind of squeezes this part of the valley fairly tightly. And there's a golf course on Utah Lake that has nice business offices. And so we have our business office here in Utah, in Vineyard, Utah specifically. So very close to where you were. Is that where there's the, like a bowl effect and you get like dust bowls? And <laughs> I think that's vaguely what I remember. You get a couple of things. You get lake effect snow and some lake effect weather. You know, the water maintains its temperature better than land does. And so you get the dynamics of that impacting snowfall and humidity levels, that type of thing. But you also, because we're in a valley, in a high mountain valley, you get what locally is called inversion, where you get a warm air layer that traps a cold air layer below. And that cold air layer gets really dirty and it gets filled up with you know, pollution. And in California, we would call it smog, but here it's, we refer to the meteorological phenomenon of inversion. But it's weird because you could be down in the valley and then drive up 40 minutes into Park City and it's blue skies, it's a little bit warmer and it's clear. And then you drive back into the valley and it's like you went into industrial production zone or something. Yeah, so I remember. Did you grow up there? No, I grew up in Southern California. I was born in Palm Springs, and then I lived in a little town in the high desert called Yucca Valley. And I lived there until I was 14, and I moved to Atlanta, Georgia. My parents moved us there for my father's job. And then I came to Brigham Young University in Utah, and then I've stayed. I've lived in both states. I've lived in Atlanta for a couple of stretches, so familiar with that town. And then I lived in uh, prior to home now, which is Minneapolis. I've lived in LA, but my heart home is New York. <laughs> so that's where I grew up. Yeah. I was going to ask what you actually want to call home. So New York is where you'd actually call home. Where in New York? Just outside the city. Yonkers, New York is where I grew up. Technically, I was born in El Salvador, but I, my parents brought me over here when I was a year old. I mean, as soon as I was eligible to drive, I made my way to New York City and <laughs> didn't look back after college, went there, lived in various spots in the city, every side, East Village, Brooklyn. Yeah. Love the energy. Try to get back as often as I can. My, my folks still there. Still live there. Yeah. So now the real important question, Mets or Yankees? Yankees, 1000%. <laughs> the Mets have a terrible uniform. I like the Yankees a lot. I think they make baseball more exciting. I just wish they could win in the postseason a little bit more. I would appreciate that. It's interesting because we got our folks into it. So my mom is like, Die hard now. She screams at the TV <laughs> when, they're, when they're playing. But in 96, when they clinched, the, the game that they clinched the World Series, we were in Yonkers watching the game and we got in our cars. We drove down to Yankee Stadium immediately and we got online because it's still, there was none, none of that lottery stuff. You just literally get online and you wait for tickets. And so I think we ended up being like 24 hours or 26 hours or something like that. So we, overnight, we had lawn chairs. We lost the lawn chairs during like a midnight like stampede when someone thought like the gates were opening. So it was pretty hectic for a while because it was almost scary because you thought you were going to get crushed by this sea of people. <laughs> and our lawn chairs literally got sucked out of our hands. I was like, okay, <laughs> just keep going. And then when we got to the gate, so this is the next morning, like we got, finally got to the gate and they're selling out games one, two, three, four, five. We get to the window and he's like, we only have games six and seven. And we're like, all right, we'll take game six. And, you know, as a true Yankee fan, I'm thinking, well, they're going to sweep it. So I'm probably not even going to get to see a World Series game. So for anyone that remembers, they were playing Atlanta of all people. And Atlanta was, you know, had a really solid team at that point. So Atlanta won the first two games. And we're like, oh, they're going to get swept. And then the Yankees won three, they won four, they won five. So game six is in Yankee Stadium. And so we had you know, tickets for what could possibly be like the clincher and they clinched it and they won the World Series in the old Yankee Stadium, 60,000 plus people like losing their mind. <laughs> you think it's a solid concrete, you know, stadium and bleachers, but, but you know, that starts vibrating and shaking when you got that many people like going crazy. So that was the pinnacle as a sports and Yankee fan. And I haven't been following as much since, but I feel like I checked off the box <laughs> in terms of like sports moments for myself. Yeah, I love that. That's a great story, especially when you add in the chaos of losing the lawn chairs. That's a great thing to remember. Do you keep your tickets, your stubs at least? Yeah, I, I like to think that I did and they're somewhere, but <laughs> I couldn't. I've moved so much, I don't even know where they would be at this time. But it, it's nice. I have made it to the new stadium as well. So 
I follow them from afar. And obviously while I'm there with my folks, we get into the games as well. So it's nice. It's just, I don't have time to watch any sports. I watched, I think the only sports I watched this year was a couple of in-person games here in Minneapolis. And then I think I watched the US England soccer game (laughs) in the World Cup. That's about it. Oh, that wasn't that bad of a game. No, it was a good uh, showing. Unfortunately, they really have a challenge making it far in that thing. And so I always end up rooting for some of the other teams like Brazil and some of the Colombia as well. Brazil had a pretty rough knockout. It'll be interesting to see how, I think today, isn't it France and Morocco today? Yeah, my brother-in-law's French, so he's probably (laughs) glued to the TV right now. So I think they're playing. I think it was like a noon game. I don't know. I feel like it's going on right now, probably. Yeah, so thanks for that background. And obviously, we're all over the map with this, <laughs> kicking off this conversation. So just circling back to, you know, how you got started in this, you know, there's obviously a couple of different paths you can go down. And like a lot of the CEOs I've interviewed and founders on this show, you know, they made their move into crops, leaf greens, and other a wide variety of crops, which we've covered on this show. But you decided to go into a livestock feed. And I think this may be the first company that's focused on that that I've spoken to, if memory serves me correctly, and I know my listeners will keep me honest here, but how do you make that decision? You know, what data points did you have in place? Obviously, like you said, you didn't come from this background. And because it's such a new industry, vertical farming as well, you know, folks are still learning, getting their feet wet, figuring out what makes sense for them. So I'm I'm curious, you know, how you ended up here. Yeah, I'm not sure the best way to tell the story, but Based on our experiences in software, we we realized that a lot of people will pick up the phone and answer if you call enough people. And I know that probably intuitively makes sense, but a lot of people forget that when they're looking at starting a business. And so we called about 300 livestock producers and just talked to them about their initial issues, their primary issues, their operating issues, what's most important to them on a day-to-day basis, what has the biggest impact on their production capacity, what changes the value of their product in the market, what hurts them, what helps them, that type of thing. And through those interactions, just over the phone mostly, we did go to a couple on-farm visits as well. But through speaking to all of these producers, we learned that you know they're pretty high cost from an operating perspective on livestock feed. Forages being the highest in volume, not necessarily the highest in cost per pound, but the highest in volume. And protein and micronutrients and mineral packages probably being the highest per pound, lower in volume though. And they would describe often that, let's say 70 to 80% of their operating, daily operating costs were tied up in forages and feed cost. And so it was pretty high. And then, you know, me not being, I was fairly naive about, you know, the economics of ag production and livestock production in particular. I asked a whole bunch of questions and my business partner did the same that probably sounded really dumb to the livestock producer. They're like, man, these guys have no idea what they're doing and what they're getting into. But we'd ask questions like, okay, what if you had more land? What would you do with it? And they would describe that uh, several different things that people fall into different categories with more land, they might have more animals, increase the volume of their production, or with more land, they might create a cash crop so they can cover and mitigate their risk on their animal production or their meat, milk, and egg production, or a different crop. Like I said, they're growing alfalfa, but they had another crop. They'd grow corn or something that's high in volume that season and use that as a cash crop. Others would look to diversify their farm and have more types of animals on the farm. And so we went through all these different groups and we learned that there was a lot of commonality in between, but they're all paying a high price from their perspective for forages and for protein and for minerals and other micronutrients. And yet, despite them paying a high price, they had no control over it by and large. So, you know, if you and I look at our cell phones, what type of cell phone do you use, Harry? iPhone. iPhone. It's a premium phone. You pay a tremendous amount of money for it. And now imagine that that phone was inconsistent and every day was a different type of phone, but you paid a lot. You pay a thousand dollars for the iPhone 13 or whatever it is, but, it, but tomorrow it's suddenly like a Google pixel phone, or it's a Microsoft phone, or it's a Nokia phone, or it's a Samsung phone. And all those are fine phones, but you know, you wanted an iPhone. And so there's that gap in, it, in what you expect and what you get. And then let's say that when it is an iPhone, it crashes all the time and it doesn't work. You have bugs and you can't get down all your apps and you have 
problems with connectivity and keeping a phone call, not dropping a phone call, et cetera, et cetera. You'd be really frustrated and you wouldn't buy that premium product anymore. You wouldn't spend all that money on it. And you would navigate over to the product that shows up consistently. It's always there, gives you the experience that you wanted, and it's predictable. But with livestock producers, the thing they're paying the most for on a daily operating basis is the least consistent and the least predictable. And you know, I would never would have imagined that being true. And it's not because the livestock producer is not smart or they don't know better. It's because the market economics around them and market conditions around them make it so. You know, they can only buy so much feed at a time. Feed comes from the land. It has to be produced. Therefore, it's you know, susceptible to drought and to insects and to other market dynamics. Like maybe I was growing alfalfa last year and had a terrible drought. It decimated my alfalfa fields. I had to replant. And as I'm going to replant, I get an offer from someone else to sell my land for, you know, a really nice high-end housing development. And so I think, oh, do I start over from an alfalfa perspective or do I just get rid of it and make, you know, as much as I could make in 50 years of farming all at once? And so you have these conditions that change availability of product, that impact the nutritional value of the product and how it performs for your animal. And that we learned by talking to all these livestock producers is a true thing. And so what we found is that these guys, men and women, both are always on the hook for their animal feed. Animals have to eat every day, multiple times a day. And then when their feed changes, you know, the animal's performance goes up or down, shifts a little bit as they go through like a naturalization process where they adjust to the new feed. Then their quality of the feed changing based on when it was harvested, where it was harvested, how it's been stored, how it was shipped to you. And there's all these logistics that go into it. And so out of that, we thought, you know, maybe there's a real opportunity to be a foundational partner in production for these livestock producers by focusing first on forage. And is there a way to make forage consistent, readily available, and on farm so that they're not dealing with all of these other, you know, conditional environments that they have no control over and they're at the mercy of? So they can focus on their animal husbandry, what they're really, really good at. I mean, you know, these individuals know how to take care of animals and are examples, you know, to the rest of us of how we can, you know, look at our own lives. But they're not in control of the forage market. They're not in control of the protein market. They're not in control of the micronutrient market. So we thought was, hey, maybe we could start with forages and this vertical farming offer a solution for livestock forage production on farm and to do it in a way that makes a premium forage that is worth a premium price, meaning it's consistent. It gives you all the value you're looking for, the impact on the animal that you're looking for, and it has a real place in livestock feed. That's the short, you know, 30,000 foot view of how we ended up making this decision to put our time and money into vertical farming for livestock feed. Because you're right, everybody's in leafy greens and, you know, stemmed vegetables and tomatoes. And, you know, rightly so, there's market demand for it. People consume those things. But part of our philosophy is, can we make an impact on items that are required for sustenance? You know, things you must have in order to maintain a population and to maintain health in that population. And, you know, Leafy greens and stemmed vegetables and tomatoes are very important for that, but they're not sufficient. I could eat those and still die. But if I have access to meat, milk, and eggs and they're produced properly, I can eat those primarily and still live and then add in my vegetables and leafy greens as is available. So that was our thought process. We didn't do an MBA project on it and do a macroeconomic evaluation. We didn't do any of those things. We just talked to the producers. Yeah, that makes the most sense. Coming from the startup world as an entrepreneur myself, there's a book, I think it's called The Mom Test. And it's something that SaaS companies and SaaS founders, it's sort of like one of their go-to books. But it's one of those things where you're, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, they develop things in a silo without getting feedback from the people who might actually purchase or use their service. And that's the mistake most entrepreneurs make. So The Mom Test, I think, speaks to this idea of you know, showing your product, I think it's your mom and just having her explain what it is and what it does. And if it passes that test, then you're like, you know, you're onto something. But if you have to like, hold her hand and explain like this does this, and you have to click here, and you have to go here and you have to do that. So I think just alluding to a little bit to what you're speaking to, you know, you don't know if you have a valid idea until you actually test it and you test it with the people that you would ideally want to be your customers. And I think probably that you can, you know, speak to this a little bit. But 
What was that initial feedback when you had something that you wanted to validate and maybe talk a little bit about the offerings and maybe what crops you were growing? You mentioned alfalfa. If there's anything else you had an idea to start with and you know, sort of paint the picture, you know, going back, you know, what if it's a couple of years to kind of talk through that thought process? Because you mentioned you do come from a software background. There may be some advantages to that because you're coming at it from a different perspective and how you think about solving problems is something I'd be interested to hear about. Yeah. Okay. By the way, you said Mom Test, right, is the name of that book? Yes. It made me chuckle because I did call my mother and tell her what we're doing. It turns out she has an animal science degree. Oh, great. Animal husbandry. And as a child, I used to tease her about, she took a course called Swine Science, which I thought was the funniest named course. It's a good course, a very relevant course for us now, of course. But as a child, I liked to, I harassed her quite a bit. So I did call her and she had excellent feedback and has really enjoyed watching us get into this space. So it is funny that that is also relevant for Renaissance Egg. We did do the mom test. We passed, <laughs> barely passed the mom test, but we did pass. So if we look back on how we started getting these, you know, like I said, we first called producers before we had anything. We just called them and said, what are your problems? Where do you think there's an opportunity for change in those problems and mitigating those problems and those types of things. And we decided, let's start with forage. It's not where we want to end, but it's where we want to start with premium livestock forage production through on-farm vertical farms. So our first iteration was, you know, what are the issues with on-farm forage production? And you can call those microgreens. Some people call them fodder. But what you're doing is you're sprouting a grain uh, in typical on-farm forage production environments, you're sprouting a grain and using the value of the sprouting process to enhance the value of the grain for the animal. So grain itself is phenomenal. It holds a tremendous amount of energy and it's poised and ready to go to express that energy the moment it hits the right conditions. So, you know, barley grain, for example, it begins germination when it's absorbed 35 to 45% of its weight is water and it's experienced a 35 degrees Celsius day. And then, you know, you've got germination. So these grains are packed with energy and they have protein and they have different types of fiber and they've got vitamins and, and other things. But when you sprout them, there's a lot of change that happens. You know, starch gets converted to sugar, which is great for animal feed, especially for uh, ruminant animals. Enzymes get expressed that otherwise wouldn't be there that help in digestion and help in other aspects of the animal's stomach, intestine, and those types of rumen and those types of things. You get a vitamin expression. In some cases, the vitamin levels go through the roof. In other cases, it's a minimal expression, you know, increase in expression, but in most cases it is. And then you get things like phytonutrients and metabolites that show up that otherwise wouldn't show up in the feed at a level that makes any sense for, you know, nutritional quality. So you have all these things happening. So the first thing that we knew about was, okay, if we want to do livestock forage, what's already been done? So let's go do this research and let's see what's been done. And there has been on-farm production, mostly at a hobbyist level, meaning there's not a real market, there's no industrial players, it's not industrialized, and all the knowledge sits in the mind of the different farmers that are hobbyists in this on-farm production space. And the words that they would use for it were on-farm fodder production, and it was manual, and they were taking grains and putting in a tray, applying water and temperature controls and some light to turn it green, and then they were feeding it to their animals six, seven to 10 days later, and they would talk about all these upsides and all these benefits. However, as we got deeper into it, we learned there were some real negatives that caused it from getting outside of being a hobbyist market, as I described it. And that was primarily manual labor, a lot of work. The farmer already has a lot of work. The livestock producer already has a lot of work. Now we're putting more work on their plate. Now they have to outsource and hire more hands to work, which cuts into their you know, top line revenue and has all these other downstream effects. So labor was a really big issue and a big barrier. That was number one. The second thing we found was mold and inconsistency. Because it was a hobbyist market and most of the knowledge was in the minds of the farmers that were doing it, there wasn't an established practice and protocol for how do you really get the grain to express itself properly? And what's the upper limit on that? What's the lower limit on that? Where is it good? Where is it bad? Where does fodder fit or microgreens? Where do they fit? Where do they not fit? And so you'd hear all these crazy stories. I mean, we would hear people when we first got into this that would tell us that the grain was creating dry matter through the sprouting process. 
And then others will say, no, it's impossible to do that. It's going to consume dry matter during the process or proteins are going to be expressed, you know, 10 times higher than what the grain itself has. And then the next person will say, no, that's not possible. It just That's not science. It does less. It does more. It was all over the place. So our first thing that we did was look at how do we solve for a couple of these problems? One, how do we solve for the labor problem? Is there an automation path there? And that's appealing, especially coming from software, where maybe we can apply some software learning to this space. Number two, how do we create a consistent product that doesn't have mold problems or you know, growth problems, and it consistently delivers the output? And then number three, how do we shore up the science on it so that people know what it actually is and how it fits into a ration and where it doesn't fit? Because that's just as important as where it does fit, you know, knowing the limits of it. So those are the three areas that we tried to focus on first. And, you know, the challenge in all of those areas is it takes time and money to solve for each one of those things. So, you know, our first machine that we built was very efficient. It could do a harvest. It could harvest almost 2,000 pounds, probably 1,800 pounds in 24 minutes. It would also, during that harvest process, wash the trays, reseed them, and then begin again. And so we built it with a six-day grow in mind or a six-day sprout And so you put seeds in six days later, you get your fodder, your microgreens out. And after your first six days, every single day, you're getting 1,800 to 2,000 pounds, depending on your multiple out of the machine to feed your animals. And you're putting new seed in every single day. And we figured out how to automate that process, but it was our first try. And we made a lot of mistakes. We made the machine too efficient and not resilient. And so there were a lot of fail points and we started discovering those fail points. And we learned very quickly that when you interact with an animal and you begin to give it a feed that the animal adjusts to and begins to perform with, and you take that feed away, it's actually bad for the animal. And it's not good for the livestock producer either. And so when you're in the livestock space, rather than just the software space, if you make a mistake, it's a big deal because the downstream effects are significant. It's a living animal that you're impacting. It's not, you know, can I log into my Google account or, you know, is my Spotify not streaming properly? Although I think they always stream properly over a Spotify. They feel. But, you know, it, it doesn't have that, oh, it's okay, we'll figure it out. It's inconvenient, it's painful, but in the end, no one died. In this case, you know, if you screw up animal feed, you can make a, a real impact that hurts and it hurts the farmer. And so with our very first product, we learned that the experimenting needs to be in the lab and we need to take something that's already been experimented on into the market more readily than experiment in the market, right? Software is like, hey, just throw it out there. I don't know if you use Google in its early days, but Gmail in its early days, rough product, and even got those ads in the Gmail interface that were reading your emails and, you know, adjusting ads based on it. I think they only removed the beta label from it, I think, last year. (laughs) Yeah, something like that, right? They're very smart. They know what they're doing. Yeah. And so you know, what we've tried to do is bring a software approach to a physical world, but there are upper limits to that. It is an animal and that you're impacting. And then it's the producer that's living on the production of that animal. And so there's a whole nuanced approach that needs to be taken. And we had to discover that. It's probably already been discovered by others, but we had to discover it for ourselves because we didn't know. So that first product that we brought into the market gave us a tremendous amount of learning. We're very grateful for it. It's like a love-hate relationship where it was very painful to learn those lessons, but very meaningful to learn those lessons. And fortunately, we had a phenomenal first client that is really more of a partner than a client. And he and his, they were a natural goat dairy and it's a raw goat dairy. The products are amazing, but his approach could tolerate this because he wanted the upside and he's a really thoughtful individual. So he allowed us to be on farm every single day and to learn these things and to produce. And he gave us really strong feedback and he was into details. And so because we had the right partnership with our client, we were able to survive that, take the learnings and put it back into, you know, the next version, the next iteration. And that has been something that, you know, we feel emotionally indebted to this individual for the rest of our lives, because it was through that experience that we gained a tremendous amount of knowledge that otherwise we just couldn't have gained. I don't think I really I think I answered a different question, but forgive me for that, Harry. No, no, no. I think that's helpful because I think, you know, there's so many different paths to figuring out 
whether you have a viable product, whether you have something that the market needs, the market wants. And even when you think that you have met those criteria, if you're not delivering something that's useful to them or that makes their job harder or makes their job less predictable, it's, you know, speaking to the importance of having consistency when you're talking about live animals. I mean, that's something to be really conscious of and, and having a partner that can be patient with you as you're working through the kinks, as you're figuring out what works, what doesn't, you know, that's invaluable. Like, again, with the software analogy, like those first customers, like I remember like my first customer, like I bent over backwards to just make sure I do everything that he said. He's like, can you do that? I'm like, yeah, we can do that. We can do that. Right. <laughs> we'll figure it out and you iterate. And so, you know, those early first clients have a special place in my heart. And I'm sure it's, you know, as you've mentioned, the same thing for you. So now fast forward to present day, what's the current offerings and, you know, what are the markets that you're serving? Yeah. So we have come quite a way since then, even though it's only been, you know, two years and nine months, but we have a machine, for example, we have a machine about 45 minutes south of us in an area called Nephi, Utah, that will produce 16,000 pounds a day. So as I talked to you about, uh, the first machine was, if I remember right, it was about 1,800 pounds a day. We were targeting 2,000. We never quite got there with that first machine. Our current ideology around machine development and growth is completely different than our first one, and I can take you through that in just a moment. But this machine will do 16,000 pounds a day. It's 16 feet tall, 104 feet long, 8 feet wide, and it's being used in ways we hadn't conceived of. And we just let the customer and the market kind of educate us as we went, you know, and our ideology is that we don't know anything about anything and we know nothing about everything. And some people will really go too far on that. They'll be like, yeah, I accept that you're out. I don't want to even talk to you, you know, but others yeah. other people are really saying, which is we're curious, we're open to, you know, the data coming back and educating us. We're not coming in and trying to impose an ideology. Our ideology is to come in and learn and then adjust based on what's happening. So, you know, these types of ideologies need movement. I can't sit in a room and figure this out. I need to go out into the space and start to navigate that space to figure out my path. And that's expensive. There's pain that comes along with it. But that is our ideology. Our ideology is the only way forward is to begin moving and then to learn how to interpret which way we should go at what time. And so, you know, one of the things we've ended up with is a much larger machine that does a tremendous amount more per day and is not an efficient machine the way our first machine was. We would do, you know, 1800 pounds in 24 minutes and that was done. And then it sat idle the rest of the day. And, you know, we applied water and temperature controls, but the machine didn't move except for once a day. The machine now it moves continuously as it moves things around and adjusts the climate and adjusts the watering and the temperature and the humidity and other things. So it's not efficient in the same way. What it is really efficient at is being resilient. This machine, to break it, would be very difficult to do. So it can be consistent for the farmer. It can show up every single day. And if there is an issue, it's not catastrophic. It's a small, you know, contained issue that can be handled in a very short amount of time. With our previous, you know, our first version, any issue we had was basically catastrophic. And sometimes we were there till three in the morning working to fix it. And there till late at night. And that's not good you know, for your family, you know, my poor wife had to deal with all sorts of uncertainty when I'd be home, what shape I'd show up when I was at home, you know, how many times I cut my hand or smashed a finger or did something stupid. And, you know, this new evolution gives us the opportunity to be far more consistent, far less catastrophic in our errors and our mistakes, and to give the farmer what they need every single day, which is that premium feed that's consistent, reliable, and on farm. Yeah. And I think what's important is what you alluded to earlier. They've got so much else on their plate. You know, they've got a full day. They're probably working, you know, 16, 20 hour days sometimes, you know. There's no such thing as vacation in this space. Yeah. And having something that they don't have to worry about, that's easy to maintain, that doesn't require a lot of support. And it, like to your point, if it does break, it's something that they could be trained on to fix pretty quickly. To get back up and running, I think, is what was really critical in terms of like designing something like that. And so now that these are out in the field, you know, what's been the feedback from the farmers themselves in terms of how this has changed, like their day to day and what life was like before working with you guys? Yeah, I would say, you know, the, the feedback, and this is why I love many things about the livestock producers of the world, but 
one of the things I love most is that the feedback is always centered around, did it improve my life or did it hurt my life? And that's really it. It's not a lot of, oh, you know, it was a really cool idea. And, you know, I wish you guys the best. It was like, hey, this thing helped me and I want more of it. Or this thing is not helpful at all. Get away from me and quit wasting my time. And so, you know, the, the feedback we've had thus far is that on-farm premium forage production is very, very sticky. If you can do it, our clients want it to be done over and over and over again. And they want to stay in the game and they want this foundational feed because, you know, from their perspective, all these variables and all these changing conditions are usually hurtful to their economics and to their animals. And so if you can show up with a machine that performs consistently 365 days a year, whether it's cold outside or hot outside or icy or snowy or whatever, it becomes something that they really care about. So the feedback thus far has been very emotional, backed by a very logical outcome. And we are so appreciative of that because like I said, our goal is to be a foundational partner of production. We're starting with forage, but what we're really chasing is freedom. And domestic food production at a local level is one of the most important factors for freedom. And these guys and men and women are telling us where we're helping them be free in their day and be free to focus on their animal and where we're not. And thus far, the feedback has been very strong that you know this type of on-farm forage production be very valuable for them. But, you know, can we consistently do it? How long does the machine last for? You know, we're still in the early stages of that. You know, is this a really great program for 12 months? And then, you know, the 13th month, everything breaks and falls apart. We don't know. You know, that's the part that we're still working towards. No one has used any of our machines for that long yet. Like I said, we're two years, nine months old, and our new machines are very new. And our old machines, obviously, we switched them out. So I don't know what the feedback will be in 12 months from now, or even what it'll be in six months from now. But right now, the feedback is full of hope and promise because they're getting something that they want and they're now able to do things they couldn't do before. For example, we have a group, Dairy Farm in Canada, that is reusing their land. So because it's called land sparing, so to speak, that because of the forage production capacity of our machines, they'll be able to put more animals on their pasture without overburdening their pasture. And then another part of their land, they can sell for, you know, corn production or something else. And so those types of data points are really valuable for us in feedback as well. So we're really encouraged by the feedback. But again, I mean, there's a real burden that comes with that because the further we go and the more animals we impact, the more the responsibility is on us to deliver every single day, not once a quarter updates or whatever, but every single day, the machine needs to perform and produce that livestock forage. Because it becomes foundational, meaning, and let me just describe that real quick, Harry. What foundational means in this case, their ration planning is based around the fodder production being consistent every day. So, hey, I need 16,000 pounds a day of fodder, and that's going to equate to 40% of my ration. And the rest of the ration I can make adjustments on because of the premium nature of the nutrition in the fodder and the starch conversion, the sugar and the vitamin expression, the phytonutrients and detergent, non-detergent fibers, those types of things. Because of that consistent production, I can now be more flexible in what other feed I bring into the animal's diet. If we didn't take that away, man, we've really hurt them because now we're out of balance and we've taken away their foundational feed. So that's where that pressure comes in. We have to deliver. Otherwise, you know, all this feedback is for naught. And so since this is the concept of fodder is new to me and maybe to some of the listeners, is there a specific crop when you talk about fodder, when you talk about forage, are you referring to a specific crop? Most of the time right now, it's barley seed or wheat seed being sprouted as a microgreen. However, that's just based on, like I said, the hobbyist market and the traditions in the space. But we think there's room for a lot of other seed types to be included to target feed certain types of animals. For example, we've tested 14 different seed types from day zero to day 10 in their sprouting process. Timeline to sprout, energy consumption to sprout, you know, water consumption to sprout. But then what you get in return for that from a nutrient perspective and all of those aspects and how to blend a ration. So what we want to do is create targeted feeds for chicken or horses or pigs or cows or beef cows versus dairy cows. Targeted feeds when the animal's transitioning, when they're weaning, when they're backgrounding, when they're milking, you know, all of these different 
milestones in the animal's life often require different feed programs and different rations. And so we think that nature has already done her job and created all the feed that is required for these animals. We just want to make sure that we're leveraging what nature has done and bringing it to the animal at the right time. Yeah, I mean, when you mention all the different phases of the animal's growth and all the different variations of livestock that you can support, it seems like you definitely, if you think about it from a, again, software analogy, roadmap perspective, you've got a lot of different paths you can go down. So when you think about where is the best use of the team's time from R&D perspective and figuring out, you know, where's the best use for you to put in development time? How do you make those decisions? Yeah, great question. So the first way we looked at it was, where's the market today? Can we just meet the market where it's at? Oh, it's a hobbyist market. Okay, in the hobby market world, what type of livestock producers have primarily grown their own fodder and fed it to their animals? Dairy, both goat and beef dairy, and then chickens and poultry has had quite a bit. And then there's been you know, some hobby stuff around meat rabbits and camels and horses. So we said, okay, we have to make a business decision, which is when we begin to enter this market, where do we want to focus? And our first two areas of focus are dairy farms and beef farms. And then it was, okay, what's already well understood as much as possible in this space? And that was barley uh, grains and wheat grains typically are the foundational grains for creating the microgreens. So we said, okay, that's fine. We'll start there. But we want to know, like, I'm not interested in guessing. I will guess if I have to, but my real goal and my business partner's goal is to turn a guess into a question and then ask as many people as we can, gather as much feedback as we can, and then make a decision based on that feedback. We're not saying you tell us the answer. We're saying you tell us what you think is the answer. And then we'll use our discernment to decide if we agree or disagree. And if we disagree, we need to keep finding more information until we are, have been taught that actually our disagreement was wrong. And if we do agree, we also go out and find more information until we find that our agreement was wrong. So we're always trying to prove the counter argument in our data research programs. So we took barley and wheat. We first studied those, had them in, analyzed chemically from day zero as a seed all the way to day 10 as a sprout and said, what's the optimal sprout time? Six days. What's the nutrition path during that time? Protein expression, vitamins, nutrients, phytonutrients, enzymes, fibers, et cetera, for barley and wheat. And then we said, okay, what if barley and wheat are not the best? What if that's just what people are used to using and grandpa did it, so I do it, or grandma did it, so I do it. What if there's other uh, grains that are valuable? So we picked the 14 most common grains and went and studied those the same way. It was pretty expensive. It took a long time, but we did it. And then we said, okay, now how do we balance rations based on that? Because we're focused on the beef industry and the dairy industry initially. And the dairy is both goat dairy, camel dairy, or I shouldn't say both. There's three, primarily, you know, cow dairy, goat dairy, and then camel dairy. And then beef is, you know, what it is. But there's all different stages in beef, which I did not know, right? The average consumer yeah. myself thinks, you know, I like ribeyes, I like New York strip. I didn't really know all the stages of the animal life, you know, from uh, cow-calf operations to backgrounding to feedlots and other stages. So we're focused on first cow-calf within the beef industry, and then how do we support the entire life cycle of the beef cow over time? But with that in mind, we looked at barley and wheat first and said, let's solve for that. Then let's look and say, maybe our solve is wrong and that we need to have more data to understand if we did the right thing or not. So then we studied those data points. Then we formed some partnerships in the academic space to give us more rigor around our scientific approach. We have a partnership with Utah State University, Cornell, and the University of Florida to really shore up the science and to make it so that we can do an on-farm translation. You know, often what you read about in a book sounds great, but it's very hard to implement in real life. And so we set up a business unit inside of our company to be focused on that because your question is really good about how do you make these decisions and then how do you align the company appropriately? So we created the Microgreen Institute inside of our company to focus on these issues of what's the value of sprouts or microgreens or fodder or whatever name is used you know, regionally to represent a sprouted grain as animal feed. What's the nutritional value? Where does it do really well? Where is it weak? 
Is there anything we can do about its weaknesses? Is there anything that could happen to eliminate its strengths? And then forming these academic partnerships and these studies and then on-farm handholding. So our microgreen institute will do ration planning for our customers. So if you have a cow-calf operation and you have, you know, X amount of hay and X amount of alfalfa and X amount of corn and silage and micronutrients, and these are your targets and you're in the upper Midwest or you're in the Sierra Nevadas or wherever you are, our team can build the ration for you and guide you, you know, on that path of how do you feed your animals to get the targeted outcomes. So that's the Microgreen Institute. The leader of the Microgreen Institute is a veterinarian that's also a nutritionist. He's been practicing for 35 plus years. And then he's got some PhDs in animal science and plant science behind him, as well as masters in plant science and so on. So it's a very academic group that's focused on nutritional value of microgreens, upper lower limits, ration planning, and how to actually get the desired outcomes through your animal production by including this as a livestock feed. They also focus on how to grow it and, you know, the optimal grow times and on all of that. Then we have an engineering unit that is focused on how do I bring that to an on-farm production environment? How do I create a local vertical farm that's economically viable, that's consistent, and has a long lifespan? So our engineering team is focused on practical implementation of what the Microgreen Institute discovers. Then we have a client team that's focused on, okay, we have a machine, we have the knowledge and the know-how, we can marry those together, but then how do we allow the client to get the value into their production? Because everybody's production is different. There's no such thing as a standard livestock production facility. So maybe one is centralized, one's decentralized. Maybe they have big mixers or small mixers, or they have a lot of automation or no automation. That team just helps bridge the gap between the reality of fodder production and the reality of their feed programs and their facility management. And that's allowed us to do a lot with a little team because everyone is not trying to solve the same problem. We have the Microgreen Institute that's solving the science and the nutritional value and the, the know-how. Then we have an engineering team that's focused on bringing it to life and doing all the work in an automated environment so that we add no additional burden to the producer. And we're not all the way there yet. There's still some burdens that the producer has to handle but we're getting closer and closer to a no additional burden implementation. And then there's the ongoing life cycle of getting that value into your animals day after day after day with our implementation team. And we think with those three groups really tied together and client centric, we're going to eventually solve these problems for our clients. And that's what we care about. We don't care about our problems. We care about the problems of our clients. And we know if we can eliminate those, our clients will never want to leave us because we're a true partner production. That is actually the exact way I would answer your question. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that in-depth, detailed answer because I think, you know, a lot of people wonder how to tackle all the different problems that you're trying to solve for. And I think your approach to breaking it up into teams and so that people are laser focused on the outcome for what they're trying to achieve, I think it should help to make sure that everyone's you know, got their marching orders. And then when you bring the teams together, you know, they're all enhancing each other and their findings. I'm curious, you know, how big the team is and, you know, how that's growing and what, if any challenges you may foresee going forward. Oh yeah, sure. So I don't know in exact what order I want to answer that question in, but the team has 19 people on it. So Renaissance Ag is comprised of 19 individuals that work inside this company across the Microgreen Institute, the engineering and there's multiple aspects within engineering. There's physical engineering, there's the automation, electrical engineering and automation, and then implementation. And then we have a background group like marketing and fabrication that support engineering implementation and the Microgreen Institute. But they're all client facing, meaning each one of them interacts with clients. Each one of them is focused on solving client problems so that we're not looking at each other thinking, hey, look how good we're doing but the rest of the world could care less what we're doing. You know, that's an easy trap to fall into. So that's number one, 19 individuals focused in each one of their areas, but bound together by the client facing approach that we have. So that's number one. What was the second part of your question, Harry? And I'm curious, what if any challenges you might foresee in terms of figuring out where you want to grow the team? Yeah. So there's quite a few challenges that we foresee impacting growth on the team. Let me give you an example. Our product needs to be automated. So right now our machines are automated. That's great. We can produce fodder 
every single day without the client touching anything. However, once that fodder is produced, it then has to be touched and delivered to the animal. And so we're part of our focus is how do we improve that process and take any friction out of it? Like how do animals actually eat? We produce 85 pound biscuits of fodder. Well, most animals aren't eating 85 pounds of fodder all at once. And when they are, let's say a large room in an animal, like a cow, they don't have upper teeth. So they've got to work their way through the fodder. So they toss their head, kind of rip it as they go. And so how do we improve the animal's access to that nutrition? So there's some innovations that we're working on right now to do that so that the fodder gets to the animal without the farmer having to intervene in the right condition for that animal to eat it without extra work or extra waste. So that's one area to innovate in that is a problem that we need to solve, but it's a good problem. Then there's another area that's a hard problem. It's a good problem, but it's very hard and it's not readily solvable, which is, and I'm sure you've already recognized this, our machine is heavily dependent upon seed because we're taking seed and sprouting it. And so where do we get the seed from and what quality of seed is best? And what we've learned is that in the commodity market, like the seed market, there's not a lot of depth on understanding the value of the seed. Now, I'm going to offend some people by saying that. So let me just explain what I mean by not a lot of depth. There's all sorts of seed types, even within a grain vertical. So let's say barley. Within barley, there's all sorts of barley types. Golden eye barley, for example, and, and other types. And they, they're called certified seed. And somebody that was very smart put a lot of work into breeding that seed to hit certain genetic markers and certain performance markers in when it's sprouted or when it's grown as a grain. For example, you know, how one grain planted, how many grains does it produce when it grows up into a harvestable plant? You know, these types of markers are very important. So there's this, all this knowledge around that, but golden eye, for example, produced in one farmer's field does not have the same nutritional value as golden eye produced in another farmer's field because each field is mm. different. And as it turns out, again, it's intuitive, but you don't think about it until you have to get into the business. Grain is heavily dependent upon the ground for its actual value. It's not the name. It's not that it's genetically golden eye and good enough. It was golden eye and it was grown in a mineral rich soil that was regeneratively managed. And so it was rich in phytonutrients and rich in vitamins and it held its water really well. And so even though there was a drought, it still produced grains that were big and full of energy and full of stars that could be converted and full of the active enzymes, but more importantly, full of minerals. That's in field A. In field B, it's pretty bare ground. It's a rough go. The farmer's amazing, but you know they're given the earth they're given. And so they had to do a lot of mitigating techniques to get the grain to express itself, but there weren't minerals in that ground. And so unless the farmer could afford to apply minerals to that ground, those grains, still golden eye, still nice grains, don't have the same mineral profile as the grains from farm uh, field A. And so that we don't have a depth of understanding because it's expensive to test grains. And so people don't want to pay for that, rightly so, because it cuts into their bottom line. And so they say, it's golden eye, good enough. Well, when you're leveraging that as a sprout, there's a weakness there, which is if I don't control the production quality and value of that seed, I am not really in control of the production quality of our machines because they're expressing that seed and they're bound by the seed. No machine on this earth can get a seed to perform better than it can. It can hurt it. It can provide bad environmental conditions, bad water, bad temperatures, bad humidity, mold, you know, things that hurt the expression of the seed, but it cannot outperform the seed. One machine cannot get the seed to do better than another machine as far as exceeding the value of the seed itself. It can only hurt it. And so really the big hurdle in front of us then is how do we produce the grains from the beginning? And so we have a resolution path for that. We're building a division in our business to manage that and to bring better and better grains into our livestock producers' environments. But until that's done, that is a weakness that has to be overcome or mitigated. You know, and so now what we do is we do a lot of testing. We test those grains and we figured out an algorithm and a machine that can tell you by the weight and how much water we put into it and the initial test, if it's hitting certain markers or not. You know, some things that we can do, but that is a forward thinking problem that we're facing and that we want to address. And we think we have a pathway to address, but we're not there yet.
that's an example. So I didn't answer the whole part. Yeah, that's helpful because I think it helps the listener understand, you know, your thought process as you try to tackle these problems. And again, to your point, you're not going to have the solution figured out and now, and you don't know what the different variables are that are going to be in the future that might challenge some of those assumptions that you might have about where you want to go with this. But I think the approach you're taking makes a lot of sense. And I think it puts you in a great position to succeed. For the benefit of the listener, we actually connected in Dubai, of all places. So I'm curious, you know, you've had experience with uh, the livestock here in the West. And I'm wondering if that was your first time there or what that experience has been like, because you did mention camels. So I thought I'd bring that up and see if there's any specific challenges you're having as you work your way into that market. Yeah, there are. So it wasn't my first time there. I've been before for software and then I've been before for ag. But this time specifically, we were there to do a couple of things. We have some meaningful partnerships formed in Middle East and GCC that we've been working on for a while. So there were some important meetings. And then we did a presentation in one of the panels for Cultivated regarding livestock feed as a target for vertical farming. You know, my whole approach on that is if you want to be food independent, which is what vertical farming often talks about, you know, controlled environment ag is indelibly tied to food sustainability and food independence. And that is fantastic. But everyone always thinks of that in terms of leafy greens, stem vegetables, tomatoes, that type of thing. But that does not give you food independence because you cannot sustain a population on those things alone. You need milk and eggs at some volume. Even if you're consuming it in a very low volume, you still need them for their protein and mineral and fatty acid profiles and protein energies and, and other things. And then there's the positive impact of animals on land that's properly managed. So there's all these ecosystem benefits as well, if done right. And I'm not saying everybody does it right. I'm just saying if done right, it's very positive. And so there's this growing demand in the Middle East for food independence and food security, and rightly so. I think every nation deserves to be able to produce all of these sustenance for their population without anyone else's intervention or, you know, needing another partner in that. And, you know, the world is largely economically entwined with each other. And we have all sorts of great things that we can do, like we can ship grain from Ukraine to one country and from the U.S. to another country, and we can trade all these things. And that's all fine and wonderful. But when it comes to sustenance and being able to provide the bare necessities for your population. I think every country should be able to do that on their own. And I think they all want, to. but the Middle East is phenomenal because they want to, and they have the money to do it. And then, you know, they have this really arid environment that gets in the way of mass production of food. And so, you know, our interactions in the Middle East are very promising because we bring a companion to controlled environment, agriculture of leafy greens, tomatoes, and vegetables of, Hey, the right companion to that is indoor, vertical farming for livestock feed, and then, you know, increase that over time with a few other measures that we're bringing to bear. So the trips to Dubai and other countries in the Middle East are around those initiatives. They're state level initiatives. They're very important and they have the money and the expertise to pull it off. What we provide is a specialty within that area of livestock feed. So that's what's really interesting to me about the Middle East and is that they want this they want food independence and food security, which I think is wonderful, and they're willing to pay for it, and they have the drive to pull it off. Like not every country is in that same position. Like if you look in the United States, you know, we were very worried about drought, but we're not always interested in really solving the drought or the problems downstream. We want to use it for political advantage or other things, but we're not always trying to solve it. What I love about what's happening in Dubai is they're genuinely interested in solving this problem. So it makes sense for us to show up and to work with our partners there. Yeah, it was really eye-opening for me from all aspects and just to see some of the challenges they're facing there. And you know, shout out to Cultivated. You know, They actually flew me out there, got to meet a lot of the partners there. So I imagine that's been a pretty helpful partnership as well in terms of getting you introduced to folks in the space and people you should be talking to. Yeah, I agree with you. In fact, I'd never heard of or understood the concept of ag broker before I met Cultivated. And we've fallen in love with Cultivated. They're fantastic. And I think we have a really meaningful partnership with them. And we certainly appreciate what they're trying to do in the space of finding the people that have problems, finding the people yeah. with solutions and connecting them. I think that's great. Well, we've had a really, really insightful conversation. I want to thank you for taking the time to jump on here and educating you know, my listeners about you know, specifically the challenges 
in terms of raising fodder for livestock in a vertical farming environment. So it's been really eye-opening for me and I think for people that are interested in the topic. I imagine they'll have some more questions or be digging around on your site for more information. So as we wrap up, I'm curious, you know, because of the audience that we have here, we're speaking to a lot of your colleagues, a lot of your peers in the vertical farming space. Granted, you know, a lot of the folks that I've spoken to are doing crops, traditional crops for human consumption. And, you know, you're doing something a little bit different, but I always like to leave some space here for you if you have thoughts about, you know, what you're seeing or if you have a message to, you know, anyone that might be listening, you know, based on the experiences you've had so far in the space. Yeah. Well, first I would say, Harry, if you need to cut this all the way down to five minutes. (laughs) No, it's okay. That's why you have people that can listen to podcasts at one and a half X. And so they can get through faster if they want to. (laughs) Yeah. But also, you know, if there are only like three meaningful parts, that's fine by me. You know, I won't judge. I do have, you know, something that, that we care about immensely here that I would like to say, which is we think very highly of ag producers, not just in the U.S., but around the world. And of course, we're right here in Utah, we're in the U.S., and we love this country, and we love the ag producers of this country, and we think they're the backbone of what this country is. We also think that's true in every country. We think the ag producers of each country are truly the backbone of that country, and they produce something that's very important. And I think they're not often represented that way. And that's something that we care immensely about, is that we think the ag producer deserves a very meaningful place in, you know, the global conversations and that the ag producer is close to the ground, they're close to the production of life, and they have a unique view in this world that you don't get serving the software industry. And the software industry is full of wonderful people, but it's a completely different ethos, I think, in livestock production and agriculture in general. And so we're extremely grateful that this population is doing this hard work, even though they're not always celebrated for it, right? We look at economically, on-farm economics in the United States are down over the last eight years, 45%, and yet they're still in the game and they're sticking with it and they're still producing. And we're still consuming it at an all-time high rate, but you know the money is not making it and the economics aren't making it back to the producers. They're making it quite a bit goes into the middle of that and you know, the big industrialized ag, which you know I think has its place in society. But I think- There's a lot of room to celebrate these ag producers, and that's something that we care about. And I think I'm so grateful for how open they are to letting, you know, individuals like my business partner and I into this world, because if they wanted to, they could shut us out and they could say, hey, we've survived this long. We can survive another this long without you. And I think that's true. So that's number one. I want to say thank you for letting us into this world and thank you for being in it. The second one in the world of agriculture and livestock production. The second thing I'd like to say is that our ideology is not that ag needs to be disrupted in this massive way and that no one knows what they're doing and the future is in technology that disconnects animals from the program and that disconnects the consumer from a knowledge of where their products come from. We don't think that's where the future is really strong. Where we think the future is really strong is looking backwards to these animal husbandry practices that are well-worn, well-established, and leveraging technology to assist in those well-understood, well-established programs. You know, some of the people we've met are so good with their animals and they have real meaningful relationships with those animals and they love their animals and their animals love them and they get the most out of the animal and the animal gets the most out of their lifetime as well. And I think it's a wonderful thing to see. What we want to do is support that with technology so we can alleviate the burdens on the shoulders of these producers as much as possible, not replace them and not disrupt it and say, Hey, you were wrong. You don't know what you're doing. And the future is over here. Look how cool, you know, we took 400 ingredients and made a hamburger patty out of it. You know, that's fine. Uh, People will always do that. And there's always someone that will consume that product, but I don't think that's the future of agriculture. I think the future of agriculture is supporting the ag producer at a foundational level and allowing those ag producers to perpetuate over time. You know, we've gone since 1935, we've lost over 5 million ag producers in the United States alone. So we went from over 7 million to just over 2 million. And yet consumption of ag products has gone through the roof, higher than it's ever been. And what we want to do is say, let's allow those 2.1 or 2.2 million ag producers to grow to 3 million. And then let's allow the economics to get back to those producers in a way that their next generation wants to stay in the game. You know, some of these guys are men and women are five, six generations in. Let's make it eight. Let's make it 10. Let's keep that going. And that's something that we care immensely about. We can't solve that whole problem. You know, we're not geniuses or anything like that. 
uh, what we want to do is first solve on-farm premium forage production and then let the farmers and the producers tell us, hey, do we actually solve it or not? And then are we allowed to play on the next game, which maybe is protein production, livestock feed, or maybe it's water, or maybe it's something else. I don't know. Sounds like you're keeping yourselves busy for a long time to come. Lots to learn here uh, in terms of what you shared. And so I really appreciate you you coming on. And again, we're going to have all the links that you mentioned here on the show notes, renaissanceag.com. Anywhere else you want to send folks or to let them connect with you? No, I think that's great. And we appreciate you, Harry. We appreciate you letting us come on and talk to, you know, your audience and expand ours. And, you know, hopefully you can find at least six minutes of content. <laughs> yeah, we'll let the listener decide what's valuable, what's not, and they can pick and choose. So thanks again for your time, Caleb. Really appreciate it. Thanks, sir. Thanks again to Caleb for coming on the show and sharing his inspiring story and all the great work that they're doing at Renaissance Ag. As a podcaster, it's always great to meet people in person and then have that follow-up conversation on the show. And we just had a great vibe from the moment we turned the mic on. So it was really fun. Special thanks to our season seven title sponsor, Cultivated. If you're looking to a vertical farm and don't know where to start or which technology would suit your needs, reach out to them today. Best of all, their service is free because they work on behalf of their partners. Learn more at cultivated.com and that's spelled C-U-L-T-I-V-A-T-D.com. Just leave out that last E. This episode is brought to you by Indoor AgCon 2023. I'm so happy to have been working with the team last year. Indoor AgCon 2022 was my very first indoor farming conference. So it was really eye-opening for me. So I'll always be grateful to the team there for rolling out the carpet for me. <laughs> and I uh, really had a good time meeting a lot of past guests and excited to join them again this year. Entering its 10th year in a row, it's the largest trade show and conference for vertical farming and CEA, and it's returning to Caesars Forum Conference Center in Las Vegas on February 27th and 28th of 2023. Once again, they'll be co-located with the National Growers Association show as well, which is a really good fit for them. The conference keeps growing, and this year it's doubled in size. The expo floor now has more than 170 booths filled with new product resources and solutions to explore. You'll hear from experts, including CEOs, growers, investors, and others in the field during this full-scale educational conference. As always, you'll be able to connect with peers, grocers, and other potential new business partners at their great networking events. I haven't even gotten to the best part. The team at Indoor AgCon has given listeners of this show 20% off their full access conference pass. All you have to do is use promo code VFP, as in Vertical Farming Podcast, and sign up at indoor.ag. See you there. Podcast production and marketing provided by Fullcast. Learn more at fullcast.co. As a reminder, if you're enjoying this show or any past episodes, leave us a rating and a review, like Marcos did, at ratethispodcast.com forward slash VFP. We'll be sure to read those out on future episodes. Tune in next week for a conversation with a fellow podcaster. It's Trevor Williams from the Farm Traveler podcast. And that is indeed a fun perspective where we talk about each other's shows and our overlapping conversations with folks in the vertical farming space. I think you'll really, really enjoy that. It's a fun conversation. Until we meet again, here's to your health. Thanks for listening. To read the full show notes for this episode, which includes any links mentioned in the episode, as well as a full show transcription, visit verticalfarmingpodcast.com. There, you can sign up for our email list to be notified when new episodes are published. <laughs>